Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Club Metapod. I'm Mark Fernandez, and today we have the honor of getting to talk with crypto trader and investor Scott Melker, the wolf of all streets. I'm very excited about this conversation. Scott, welcome to the show, buddy. How are you? I'm great, man. This is the first time I've been interviewed by an ape, so I can uh, knock this off my bucket list for sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, it's um, look. This is only the second time I've interviewed as an ape, you know. So uh, this is all still very early days, you know. And like my face tracking technology, I promise you, audience is going to get better. When I'm not broadcasting, I'm researching, and there's all these great technologies out there uh, that specialize in face tracking. And sooner or later, the face tracking tech and the NFT avatar track uh, uh, tech is going to join together, you know, and I want to be there. Yeah, it's incredible. And honestly, I think it's, I'm sure we'll talk about all of this, but a lesson for where we're at, I think, in the cycle of what's to come is like you talking about the technology is a great corollary, I think, for everything metaverse, NFT related to just understand we're just scratching the surface of what's possible and how early we really are. I know one of my favorite tweets that I see, and I see many, many, many people use this tweet. It's almost become like a, like a meme tweet is that, you know, if you're reading this, you're, you're early, you know, and it's, and it's very true. Even though I've been around crypto since 2012, 2011, like, you know, I feel like I'm old school, but it's good to hear that I'm still early, even if you started today. Yeah, I think that's true even for Bitcoin, right? I mean, we're talking about metaverse, DeFi, NFTs, all this crazy Web3 tech, the debate that uh, keeps going on, obviously, around Web3. But I still feel like we're even early for Bitcoin. Do, do you really feel like um, being early for Bitcoin means that the ceiling, you know, we're at 52 as of this morning, which is awesome, but uh, which is 100%, more than 100% from last year at this time. Do you feel like that growth is going to keep going? Is there a ceiling to it or... Do you think um, there is no ceiling to it that we can tell as of yet? I, I don't know that there's a ceiling, but I definitely think the largest gains by a percentage basis obviously are already baked in and have been had. That doesn't mean Bitcoin's a bad investment. I think it's the most important investment in the world and that everybody should hold some. But you're talking about you entering in 2011, 2012. You're talking about buying Bitcoin at $10, an asset that's now $52,000 and it's $69,000, <laughs> right? I don't think we uh, can go from 69000 to, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars or, or, or billions to replicate those kind of gains, right? So um, I think Bitcoin has really solidified itself as a store of value in digital gold. And with that narrative comes probably, you know, uh, smaller gains, but more secure and less volatile as, as time continues doesn't mean we can't still go up 10, 20, 30 times and destroy Amen. any other market, right? I mean, we're, we're yeah. talking relative to other cryptocurrencies, not to the S&P or gold or silver or any or bonds, for God's sakes, right? Um, so I just think that if you're looking for the outside gains, uh, if you're looking to replicate what you did from being a Bitcoin in 2011, 2012 to 2021, that's going to be obviously in Web3 focused investment. Well it's really interesting you bring that up because if I contextualize that to my own story um, of, of being in crypto, getting in super early, buying on MT Gox, sp spending a month just trying to figure out how the hell do I even get this money off of MT Gox and all that whole era back then to the point where it hit, I believe it hit 600 or 800. Then it started collapsing. And then look, I'll be honest with you. I sold it all. Yeah, everyone okay. did. And, and like my my mentality then is so different than the kind of diamond hands hodl mentality now. That learning curve of the hold it because it's coming back, is that something that you need to learn the hard way? Or do you think that that's become more the approach even for, for adopters that start now? I think you had to learn it the hard way before, just like you did. But then again, you did a 60x or so if you traded it from $10 to 600 on a nascent asset with no guarantee that oh, it, it would even exist a year yeah. or two later, right? So hindsight is 2020, but and that's why I kind of joked almost everyone sold. Most people who were early on Bitcoin, not everyone, but most people sold at 1,000 or below, right? Because right. 
$1,000 was incomprehensible if you bought for 10, 15, 20, 60, $100. It really right? was. Just, no, there was no guarantee that Bitcoin would go. You had to be such a true believer or you had to literally have just lost your keys and forgotten about it, right? <laughs> right. Um, and, and so I, I think that uh, now because people have an understanding, there's a mainstream sort of recognition of the asset and what it is. We have the Michael Saylors of the world out there talking every day about how it's a you know, a hedge against inflation and this is where you should have your cash reserves and that, you know, cash is trash and fiat is bad. That's a narrative that people I don't think even comprehended or understood within or outside of the Bitcoin community until March of 2020 when markets collapsed. We saw the stock market boom, everything boom while people suffered as they printed and printed money, right? You just, I don't think you felt the money printing until the last sort of two years. And so now I think that the reason people buy Bitcoin is to hold it forever, right? right? And so it is very different. It's become less of a speculative asset, less of a trade and more of a long-term investment that someone would put in their portfolio just like they would sort of manage their IRA, buy a mutual fund, a bond, something like that. You know, you, you um, listening to your, to your podcast, um, you also seem to be quite the proponent for the the altcoins, or as what me and my buddies, you know, we've been calling shit coins for five years. Um, and do do you have the same kind of approach with the altcoins, or is that more of a trading philosophy? Because my problem is is that I'm so conditioned now to hold that even if I buy an altcoin. I just hold it. And even if it collapses, I'm like, oh, well, I guess I, you know, I'll just keep holding, you know, or do you have to kind of change your mindset to be ready to trade if it's not one of the two blue chips? I, I don't know that you have to change your mindset, but you have to know what your mindset is and what your plan is going in. There's nothing wrong with holding indefinitely. If you said the minute you bought it, this can go to zero. I'm okay with that. This is money that I can light on fire. I'm willing mm -hmm. to ride it. And maybe a lot of people have that approach because they'll buy 10 or 20 assets, just sort of the spray and the uh, pray and spray, spray and pray approach that VCs <laughs> tend to take, right? Sorry, I mumbled through that no, it's one. it's all good. But yeah, uh, basically you buy 10 things, one of them goes up 100x, nine go to zero, and that one pays for it and more, right? And I think that a lot of people sort of approach it that way. For me, most altcoins are a trade until they do well enough to become an investment. And I can explain what that means, right? Yes. Um, I, I always believed Bitcoin should be the core of the portfolio. 70% of my portfolio was Bitcoin, right? 15% for uh, altcoins, 15% in USD or USDC for buying the dip. But what happened over time was I started to believe in Ethereum a lot more. So that became sort of a 60-40 Bitcoin to Ethereum split within that 70% of my portfolio, right? So I still have my long-term hold. It's just my investment thesis became Ethereum is as valid as Bitcoin as a very long-term hold. So I view that. And then as you've been in this market for a very long time, you know that you have these incredibly insane outsized gains on all coins, right? Mm -hmm. Some, some. Man, so if yeah. I'm up 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 X as a trader, I'm selling on the way up, right? I scale in, I scale out. That's always been my approach. But that last 15 or 20%, if I'm up 50 X on an asset, that's moving to my long-term investment portfolio, never to be touched again or not mm. for 10 years. Right. So if I've done so particularly well on something, there's no reason for me not to take that little bit of the house's money and throw it over there and speculate and see if it can go, you know, another 100, 200, 300 X in the, in the following years. So that's sort of always been my approach uh, with all coins. But you have to remember, I came into the market in general as a trader, not as an investor. Right. I was mm -hmm. trading other things. There was this sort of land of these unicorn 100 X pumps. Uh, in 2016, I was much later than you. And so I came just to trade. And then I sort of backed into the importance and use case of all of these assets, Bitcoin included. So I always approached it from more of a trading mindset. And if you're a trader, you have to be booking profits. Right, right. And you came in um, around the birth of Ethereum. Is that is that around the time that you came in? No, later than the birth of Ethereum. I think Ethereum was born in 13 or 14. I can't remember the specific, but uh, you know, Ethereum was still... 18 right. bucks or something right, when right. I first for, bought it. For yeah. me, like when I say the birth of Ethereum, I mean when Ethereum was around 12 bucks, 15 bucks. Yeah. And it was like, yeah. you know, Bitcoin was starting to like bubble up again. And then this new Ethereum thing, people were talking about this crazy concept of the initial coin offering. And like, that's when things really started, you know, to like, you know, like I call it act two of crypto, right? It, it, it's Ethereum really took the ledger 
and gave the ledger a little bit of intelligence, right? Like right. We, st we still haven't figured out exactly how to use that intelligence. You know, to your point, I was listening to your podcast this morning and, you know, you said something that really hit me hard, which is like, everybody's talking about smart contracts, who's actually really using them, you know? Um, and a lot of people claim to use them and, you know, Bancor, which we were talking about before, you know, really, really uses them. Um, but um, so you got in right before all of the ICO craze happened. Yeah, ab absolutely. And it's funny to look back now that that was sort of the first iteration of Ethereum, right? And I think that that's where a lot of the sort of maximalism and tribalism surrounding the assets comes from, because, you know, by 2018 and 19, when a lot of these things went to or towards zero, right, people viewed right. Ethereum as sort of this scam or not a valid competitor to Bitcoin. I just view it as a completely different asset and different world. Right. And so, yes, I was there for the ICO craze. I benefited from some. I uh, busted out on plenty more. Uh, like everyone else, but it's so incredible now to see what Ethereum has become and what these competitive layer ones now can do, you know, improving on the initial ideas of Ethereum. And so, like I said, to me, there's Bitcoin and there's sort of everything else, right? I don't see why you have to have a conflict between the two. Uh, Bitcoin maximalism, I think, has driven us this far. It's really, uh, you know, always pushed, pushed the boundaries of where we can go towards mainstream adoption. But you know, if you just stop there, I think your growth in crypto is a bit stunted, right? Yeah, because you, like there's so much more development and so much opportunity. It's to me, it's the, the same as saying, I absolutely love gold as an investment. I would never buy Amazon. And like, right. what do those two things have to do with each other? Absolutely nothing, right? Right. So, uh, you know, one's a tech play or, you know, you call say Google or Facebook, whatever you want. But one is a tech play and one is a store of value asset and they're completely different. So yeah, I was there for the ICO craze and then, you know, Everybody saw their investments kind of going to zero for a long time. So everybody judged it as a failure. But now Ethereum and all these competitors are so much more than just platforms for launching ICOs. Yeah. And just to go down that rabbit hole for a second, because obviously, you know, I, I, you know, it's, it's written in the Hollywood Reporter. So it's not a secret. I bought my business with Ethereum back in those days. And, you know, that's when Ethereum was at like 600, you know, so, you know, um, God, just saying that sometimes makes me feel bad because of the opportunity cost. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, but it, it, it went back to eighty bucks. Right, there. right, right. Exactly, exactly. You could, uh, uh, you could have also bought back at eighty dollars. Not saying you would have, because that's when everyone was screaming. That's when I was buying again. But you know, you can't blame yourself for selling at six hundred and asset went back to eighty bucks. Right, right, right. So, so let me ask you a question. After that sort of crypto winner hit us, um, and around, I think it was like around the election time the crypto thing started booming again what do you think happened like like what 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 things made it come back out of that winter i think we had a confluence of events i pointed obviously back to sort of covid and the market crash um that's when bitcoin died right march 12th 2020 i believe was the date you know uh bitcoin crashed about 10 10, uh, 10 days ahead of the stock market, went down to 3,800 or so, sort of a combination of spot selling and obviously a cascade of leverage liquidations. And it was supposed to be dead, right? And everybody said it's over, not a hedge. It's, it, that's, that's a wrap for crypto. But then the events coming out of that for the next six months, watching what governments were doing, how governments reacted, stimulus, money printing. I mean, we've seen 40% of the money supply ever printed printed in the last 18 to 24 months, which right? is insane. And so I think there was just sort of this awakening, right? And then you had, like I said, Michael Saylor. And then of course, Tesla, after adding Bitcoin to the balance sheet, it made it sort of more of a mainstream aha mm -hmm. moment that you could take this asset seriously and that it had a real purpose, right? And of course, during that time, we had sort of DeFi summer, right? And that was the first iterations, the first excitement around these opportunities to earn yield mm -hmm. when... You just saw, obviously, money printing, inflation, interest rates going down to effectively negative. And now you can go park your money on a platform in a stable coin that's safe and earn 10, 12, 20, 30 percent a year. Right. And oh, so awesome. I think alongside and then yield farming. And so all those things just sort of happened in this perfect environment. It was like a breeding ground for opportunity where people couldn't find it. And that has led to this entire boom. And of course, listen, you, you were here early. If you were here even in 16, 17, 18, we were already talking about NFTs. The idea sure. of the metaverse was already starting to brew. 
there just weren't really chains yeah. that could support it. Like you couldn't do it on Ethereum with like uh, you know three thousand dollar gas fees. Pe people forget that when Ethereum was popping, um, the only real viable use case that had any users was Crypto Kitties, and yep. Crypto Kitties <laughs> was NFTs. like. It was yeah. NFTs, and I actually blame CryptoKitties for the collapse of Ethereum because when everybody realized, wait a minute, the only Doesn't thing work. that worked, yeah, the yeah. only thing that's out there is CryptoKitties, it means we're pretty much screwed, you know. But and, yeah, and, and obviously the gas fees associated with one project going viral showed you that at that, uh, you know, an Ethereum to 1.0, if you want to call it, uh, couldn't support, you know, multiple launches or multiple platforms on it. But that's being resolved. Yeah, and, and which is actually like a nice little segue to a question that I've been wanting to ask you. Um, and I even typed it in your chat because, uh, you know, I really would love to get your thoughts on this. Um, you know, there's this whole talk about the layer twos, right? And um, so it's a kind of a multi-part question. So number one, why do they call it layer twos and not just another blockchain when in fact it is just another blockchain? Like what, what, what are your thoughts on that? I think it's a layer two because it's built specifically to support a, a specific layer one chain. You know, like uh, Polygon, I guess, is probably the most notable at this point. The entire purpose of Polygon is to effectively make transactions faster and cheaper on Ethereum, right? And so the other layer ones are not trying to do that on another chain. They're trying to basically compete with Ethereum and form their own version. So, you know, roll-ups, snarks, all these sort of things that we're starting to talk about, which personally I think might be sort of the first wave of 2020, right? We had DeFi summer, NFT summer, this metaverse boom in fall and winter. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to be starting to talk about all these layer twos and all the things that they can do, privacy, you know, bundling transactions uh, and speeding up Ethereum and these other blockchains because at the end of the day, none of them can work at scale. Right. I don't care. Like Solana, AVAX are all incredibly fast. They're all amazing, but none of them are going to support a billion people using DeFi at the same time. Right. And that's what we're talking about if we get real mainstream adoption. So it's going to require new chains and new sort of platforms to help uh, these chains along. So layer twos are just something that's built completely to support one of the larger layer one chains, generally Ethereum, of course. And do you think that Ethereum is at this point, you know, Number one, Solidity is like the most valuable programming language to learn on the planet Earth. And number two, Ethereum has so much support behind it. Is Ethereum too big to fail or is it vulnerable to another chain that can provide all the same features without all the gas fees much faster? Too big to fail. Absolutely yeah. too big to fail. And I don't know if that's the popular opinion or not. But, it's my uh, opinion for the record. Yeah. Um, I had an incredible guest who you should have at some point. Asib Qureshi uh, mm -hmm. came on to my, my podcast and I asked him almost the exact same question. Cool. Um, and what's interesting is so when I last uh, interviewed Michael Saylor, he basically said Bitcoin should be viewed as digital real estate. And that idea went very viral after that podcast, right? Mm -hmm. And he said, listen, the granite in Manhattan, you know, if you have real estate on this solid floor in Manhattan. You never sell the real estate. You That's Bitcoin, right? You hold it forever. One day you'll take loans against it like you would. But if you bought a building in Manhattan in the 1920s, you hold it forever and you just keep taking loans and, and you have your wealth and you own the ground, right? The solid ground. That was his sort of idea for Bitcoin. Without ever hearing that, I had Hasib Qureshi on and I said, I asked him the question you did. And he said, you could think of Ethereum as Manhattan. And I said, oh, mm. That, that's not going to be very, that's going to not be very popular for comparing both Bitcoin and Ethereum to Manhattan. <laughs> and he said, so Ethereum is Manhattan and Solana is, I don't know, Houston and Avalanche is Denver, right? So where do you go, regardless of the cost of real estate, if you want to open a bank or you right. want to start a hedge fund or any of these things, regardless of the price, you go to Manhattan. Right. That's right. where you go. And that's Ethereum. You go there. Yes, it's crowded and yes, it's expensive and all these things, but it's where the demand is. It's where the building is. It's where the action is. You go there. That's nothing wrong with Houston and there's nothing wrong with Denver. But if you're going to go big, you go play with the big boys in Manhattan. And that was sort of and, and you have the network effect. And he even closed it by saying uh, that granite and real estate is useless if a bomb hits and everyone leaves. What matters is the people that are there and, and that they they believe in this sort of shared vision of what Manhattan is. And I think that that's a great corollary for Ethereum. Not my idea, his. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think uh, Ethereum is absolutely too big to fail. 
I think it will slowly improve, but I think people, including myself, are more than willing to pay those gas fees just to be on Ethereum. Yeah, I mean, just this um, just this weekend, I was part of the SOS craze, obviously, because yeah. I'm into the whole NFT thing. And we'll talk about that, too, because I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Because to me, it felt like a moment. You know, it felt like a watershed moment of how a DAO relates to its overall community. And anyway, there's some beautiful things there. But just in trying to transfer SOS around... I was paying two, three hundred dollars worth of oh, Ethereum yeah. gas fees just to move them around, just to move it around wallets. Yep. You know, like it's absolutely insane. But going back to SOS, um, what are your thoughts about that? I mean, I felt that that whole SOS thing was absolutely gorgeous. I, I agree. It's a moment. I have sort of like I don't. I wouldn't say conflicting thoughts, but interesting thoughts. So first, the fact that Open DAO was able to do this without an actual affiliation with OpenSea, I think is sort of the watershed moment there, right? Mm. Um, because we've had obviously a lot of platforms do airdrops for their own platform, for utility on their platform, but a DAO coming in and offering an airdrop based on another platform that they have no participation in directly, I think was really, really interesting and was a great uh, sort of use case or first example of how a DAO or a community can basically become relevant through an airdrop marketing instantaneously, right? Incredible. Everybody knows who they are now because they airdropped everybody free tokens, right? So I think that that's incredible. I think it's always amazing to see people get free money, right? But that's I mean, it's insane. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's insane. <laughs> yeah, it's insane. But the, does that, I mean, you know, what do you think of stimulus and money printing? Oh, it's, uh, first of all, very good point uh, because it's exactly <laughs> the same thing. It but is. way more People harmful. Love free money when it comes to them, but they love to rail against the idea of it when it's their government. And I'm not saying it really, it, it is definitely similar. I'm not saying it's the same thing, but it is funny that printing money out of uh, thin air is a very popular thing uh, when you're getting it in the crypto community, when almost the entire core ethos of the crypto community is that money printing and free money is bad. First of all, you, you just kind of blew my mind. I'm having a trouble kind of recollecting my thoughts because it's, I, I, I never made that connection. It, it, it is such an obvious one. Um, it, it, wow. Um, but it doesn't seem to have the same kind of negative adverse side effects. It, it doesn't because we're not talking about uh, endlessly printing the world global reserve currency. And it's right. a very small microcosm, a very small community. There's really nobody... It's being hurt by it, right? And obviously, money printing is is a you know it's a tax on the poor. We all know that that inflation is bad for people who can't afford to buy hard assets. It's a completely different argument. It's just very funny that, like like yourself, and I think almost anyone else, to me that was like the immediate co connection. Every time there's an airdrop, I'm like, ah, free money, right? I mean, <laughs> right. but when the government airdrops you free money, you know, <laughs> yeah, you yeah. don't get any. Um, but yeah, it's different because it's a very small community and it became a tradable asset. And the reason it kept going up is because other people chose to buy it, right? So, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a bit different because it's being traded heavily. The volume is there. And for everybody who's trying to sell it, made their profit, they're finding a buyer to buy it. So to me, it's more of a free market, but it's a free market that appeared out of thin air. Yeah, I held on to it as long as I could. I, I was one of the people that thought, look, it's only been three days, right? So, you know, I, I, I probably am being a little hypocritical here. I did dump. I did dump. It's just because I just free kept, money. It's free money, you know, and I converted it actually to another uh, DeFi platform called Depot that seems to be, um, you know, kind of popping. And I can tell you, I'm still holding my uh, Uniswap airdrop from years oh, ago. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. So one question I wanted to ask is, this is a good segue for it. Do you think that crypto, because like in the world that we live in today, um, it seems to be like the socially the popular thing to do is to politicize everything. You know, you're either, if you like, act, like, it, you know, to me, it's really funny when it affects the film industry. Like if you like Dune, you're you're on this side of the fence. If you don't like Dune, you're obviously on the that, on that side of the fence. It's it's absolutely ridiculous, but it's the oversimplified reality of social platforms. Do you think that crypto is falling into that getting politicized trap? I think it is, but not because of the crypto community. I think it is because it's large enough now to be on the radar of politicians, right? And so I would say that for us, if you've been here for a while, this is a win and not a loss, the fact that it's being politicized. Because 
at the end of the day, I, I think politicians care about one thing, and that's re-election, right? Mm -hmm. Raising money and re-election, I guess we can put it as a 1A and a 1B, but uh, one leads to the other. And so they do what they believe will get them votes. And shitting on crypto has probably been pretty high on the list uh, for a long time, but that's changing, right? I think that with the infrastructure bill, uh, they put this one line in there that was sort of a threat to the crypto community that was probably not even on their radar that they were putting it in there and there'd be a problem. And the crypto community with no lobbyists and no PAC, they stepped up and basically froze the largest bill of Biden's presidency for four days over a single sentence about crypto, right? right? And so I think for politicians, that was a huge awakening that, wow, there's a big community. And now I know that the crypto community has been blanketing their senators and their and their representatives with information and calls and, and letters. I, I know that I have trying to educate them, hopefully, and not just criticize them, right? Because you have to understand, they just don't know. It's not, I don't think most of it is as hateful as people think. I think most of them are just dismissive of it because it's, you know, they're older and they don't get it and they don't think it's important. But when their constituents start talking about it, they know it's important and it's going to be very popular now to support crypto to get reelected, I think. It, interesting. And so, yeah. And so I think that the politicization, if that's a word, <laughs> is, yeah. uh, is, uh, is, um, is, a, is a good thing for us in that regard. It's obviously bad if that takes a negative turn and it's heavy handed regulation and we suffer as a result of it, but then crypto will just move offshore and continue to innovate elsewhere. And it will just be us as Americans that sort of suffer or find ways around it. But I would right. say that within the crypto community, taking, you know, politicizing out of it, we suffer massively from tribalism and division, mm, sort of what you talked about with Dune and the other side. And I, and I hinted at it earlier about Bitcoin and Ethereum. And I think that's hugely, hugely problematic. Right. Talk to me. Talk I think to me. That, I want to hear more about that. Well, well, I think that we're too small to fight amongst ourselves. Right. Mm -hmm. If you want to become a global force, if you want mainstream adoption, you know, we can't be a bunch of uh, cartoon characters arguing on the Internet because it, it's hard to be taken seriously. And that's not a reference to your ape at all. <laughs> I'm just saying that, you know, it's, it's sort of this like for still has this vibe to some degree of this sort of fortune anonymous young men arguing over why their coin matters more or who's the bigger scammer or whatever, you know? And I think that we need to grow up a bit from, from that, but I think that that's happened, right? We have the Michael Saylors and the, even Elon Musk's right of the world. I mean, right. Ray Dalio, you know, these guys are out there talking about Bitcoin all the time. Um, so I think that people are taking us seriously, but I do think that it was encouraging when the infrastructure bill hit. It didn't matter if you were a Bitcoin maxi, an ETH maxi, if you were, you know, into Cardano or whatever it was that you were passionate about. Everybody got triggered, pissed off, and came together to fight that. Right. right. So it's nice to see that that can happen. But on a daily basis, I think we're just sort of cannibalizing ourselves when we need to work together to bring crypto to the masses. Then you can start fighting about which one. <laughs> you know, we just got to get there first. Yeah, on the on the whole sort of maxi uh, of uh, train of thought, um, I've been you know even in my own uh, you know metaverse project, there's been a lot of discussion about you know decentralization. Is it fully decentralized? What's the roadmap to being fully decentralized? Is it possible to be classified under Web three and have a kind of a hybrid model where you're trying to bring the community? into the decision making, but you still have to maintain a certain amount of product vision to actually create the execution. What, what are some of your thoughts on that? I'll go out on a limb, something I've probably never said before that just popped in my mind. I don't think anything can be fully decentralized. Okay. I just think it's impossible, right? So I've, I'm a, I've participated in DAOs now, right? Because I want to actually experience the things that I talk about. And I mean, DAOs are amazing. They may be the future of governance. We may literally see governments run like DAOs, but they're still people with opposing opinions and need somebody to lead and bring them together, mm. right? And so humans are going to be humans no matter what under any structure. And something that's truly decentralized, there could be platforms that are truly decentralized. I mean, we talk about Uniswap being decentralized. They have offices in New York City, right? I mean, right, right. talking to regulators on a daily basis. Sure. Um, I, I think that what we should aspire to in the short term is improving the situation and not view it as this sort of bipolar centralized, decentralized, and there's nothing in between. Yet again, it's this sort of like maximalist thought that it has to be one way or the other when there's so much gray area in between. And all of that gray area is so much better 
for the individuals using these platforms. This actually, so I, I talked about this recently. It's sort of similar. You know, obviously like Jack and Elon Musk have been sort of uh, criticizing Web3. Mm -hmm. uh, Elon Musk just sort of being dismissive of it, saying, I don't get it, whatever. You know, I'm making his jokes, which I think is totally fine. He'll come around. But obviously Jack, you know, he says, listen, the venture capitalists are the ones who are going to benefit from this not the people. And I think they're missing the point. Right. And so it, they, it's another thing where it's bipolar. It's like either everyone benefits or it's nothing. And there's this huge scale in between where people can have a much better situation than they have now. For example, I, what I said about that, yes, maybe the VCs will be the ones who benefit from these massive investments in web three platforms. Right. Mm -hmm. That's not the fault of crypto. That's because of regulation that doesn't allow you to invest unless you're accredited, right? So it's exactly. a whole different, exactly. and that, so that's for everything. So he's he's sort of conflating this argument. He's making it specific to Web3, but it's just the way that investment works in the United States, no matter what, period, right? right. You can't crowdsource an investment from a bunch of people who only have $1,000 in their bank account. You can't legally do it. So if you want to fund your project, you go through VC. But that's still all missing the point. So who cares? Who cares who's making all of the money from the early investment in the platform? They took the risk too, by the way. People like to forget that most of their investments go to zero. But if you are in the Philippines and you're a middle-aged woman who's been cleaning toilets at a hotel for the last 20 years, and you can go play Axie Infinity three hours a day and make more money than oh, you made cleaning toilets in a hotel, and now you have 80%, 70% more free time, does it matter who made the money as the early investor in Axie Infinity? Right. No. It matters that your life is better, right? It matters that your life is better. You're making more money. You have more free time. And Axie Infinity is the most basic game we've got out there. It's hard to use, you know, it, and they jumped all those barriers and obstacles to make that happen because it's just better for their lives, Right. My and so that's what matters. Right. So it doesn't have to be fully decentralized or fully centralized or anything. There's this whole area in the middle where the people, the users, like the people who don't have access to these systems can benefit. Right. And so I think that that's what matters. If you can, if you're an average person in a foreign country that has no access to banking, right? if you're unbanked or even underbanked, which is most of the world's population, by the way, you don't care who's making all the money on the platform where you're earning your 10% yield that you can't get elsewhere, right? You don't care who invested in that platform first. Yeah. I, um, yeah, the, the whole Axie Infinity thing, for the people that don't know about it, it's an NFT game that's about maybe a year plus old, maybe not even that old, but it's, it's the true uh, unicorn of NFT gaming in terms of actual player base and usage and um, my business partner's son, who's around 13, 14 years old, is now a full-blown entrepreneur because yeah. of Axie Infinity. I mean, he literally makes good money as a 14-year-old managing, to your point, folks overseas grinding, you know, Axie Infinity uh, clans, you know. And this is, um, this is a real thing that, like, I think for all those people that spend so many hours on the Fortnite to the world – and buy the new Spider-Man skin and all that stuff. All that stuff is cool. It's great. Fortnite's a great game. Epic's a great company. But you cannot ignore the watershed moment in gaming. I'm a gaming historian. I absolutely love games. What Axie Infinity has been able to do in terms of actually opening their platform so it benefits their users is a groundbreaking moment in games that we cannot come back from. It's like Mark Echo says, Godzilla's out of the cage, you know, at that point. Yeah, you I, go ahead. Go ahead. I hundred percent agree. Yeah, I mean, I I a hundred percent agree that that's sort of the watershed moment, right? And like I said, it's so early. It's not a great game, right? <laughs> right. It's not a great game, and, and and it's you have to understand how to get a MetaMask wallet, attach it to your Ronin wallet, and then play with the you know, and and you have to go through all of these sort of very difficult hurdles that you have to overcome to play it. But people do it because there's opportunity. So imagine when. We see games that are Fortnite level, right? That you can play for a living. You can live in that metaverse. You can own a store where people walk in in the middle of Fortnite and buy shoes and buy right. clothes. And you, you fully are immersed and live your life with your job in the metaverse, never going back to a job in the real world. 
that's not a 10 year from now reality. That's a one year from now reality. I, I totally agree. I'm obviously huge into the crypto gaming thing. I'm building my own, you know, metaverse game club, metaverse on Oculus. Um, and I've been doing a lot of research on games like Sandbox, for example. And, and Sandbox, to me, Sandbox is really interesting because it's basically Walmart. You know, it's basically here's Walmart and, you know, here are all these end stacks and, you know, here companies come and buy an end stack and put your products on it and we can, you know, help you sell them. Um, and there isn't really much of a game in, in, in Sandbox yet, but I think Sandbox as an asset is worth more than Take-Two Interactive, which has built some of the most complex gaming code ever thought of by human beings, Red Dead Redemption 2 specifically I'm talking about. But, you know, Sandbox, this this like voxel art game is bigger, not bigger in terms of usage because you can only find maybe 20, 30 people playing it at a time, but in terms of pure volume of trading like money. And, and to me, it, it's absolutely mind blowing. And um, because Ax Axie Infinity did a billion dollars in a month earlier this year was the first, you know, when they kind of went viral. Holy crap. Is that in one month? And I mean, Vegas record, I had a record setting. Million. Vegas had a record setting month uh, for all casinos in Vegas, and it was about seven hundred and fifty million dollars. So Holy Axie Infinity crap. did more income than all of Las Vegas, every single casino combined in a month when it started. That is bubble. insanity. That yeah. is insanity. To give people an idea of the scale, so imagine if you had something like you said at the scale of Fortnite or one of these. Um, but all those skins and in-game purchases actually had monetary value outside of the game that yeah. you know you could exchange for rent and cars and health insurance. Yeah, you know, one of my buddies, uh, Brock Pierce, who's been around uh, the crypto industry for a very long time, actually started out uh, with a company called Wow Gold, um, selling uh, gold for Wow, which was an extremely black market extremely you know copyright infringement thing but you know and like i'm not trying to blow you up uh, uh brock i'm trying to give you props he created a incredible multi-hundred million dollar industry out of selling world of warcraft assets in an outside market if if wow back in those days would have embraced that concept of selling their avatars of selling their their gold their items and allowing the users to own them and freely trade them to other users, God knows where WoW would be today. I mean, WoW today is pretty much done. You know, like what 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 was the biggest at scale, um, you know, metaverse ever in human history is was WoW when it was at ten million people. Today, you can barely find two three million people on there, um, which is still a lot. Look, it's still a lot. It's still the biggest. But it's not what it was, and, and it can't be. It can't be in the context of what we have now, right? I mean, it's just it was a great idea at the time; it was incredible. But now you can literally just do it with NFTs, right? Right, right. And, and you know, and for me, that that that's the really the the biggest value proposition for the audience is that you know, I'll build you the platform for you to have your fun and and and, and use as the playground, but all the assets that you use in the game should be yours. And those assets should be freely yours to do with them whatever the hell you want. Yep. And to you know, and to me, that's that's what I'm looking forward to in gaming. You know, um, and to your point, I agree with you. This isn't something five years from now. This is something for 2022. I think. I agree. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. And I think it will only listen. I mean, we won't see the true power of this will evolve indefinitely, right? I mean, yeah. what we're going to see in ten years is going to look nothing like what we see this year. I'm just saying that I think that the metaverse will become a viable opt-out opportunity for people who lack opportunity in the real world. So look, th this is starting to feel a lot to me like, you know, 2016, you know, ICO times, then you get the regulators come in. And to your point, is, this, is it a security? Because like, if you weren't crypto back in those days and you had a crypto project, that was the number one question, right? Is it is it a security or is it- the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, 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 what was the other one? Is it a security or is it a, a utility? Right? Yeah, is it a security, security or utility? Security, yep. Um, now with these NFTs, is there eminent um, 
regular, you know, regulation going to come to the NFT world? What are your thoughts on that? I mean, I think to, to me, they're more concerned with taxes than regulation, right? They just want their piece. I, I, I think, you know, NFTs sort of have precedent of behaving, at least this iteration of NFTs. I'm not talking about when we get into the real use case of NFTs, which is, you know, transferring your car title to someone and, and the bigger things that eliminate third parties, obviously. But in the sort of art and fun and gaming space, I think they're baseball cards, right? I mean, we have the precedence of trading collectibles and I think they should be treated as such. The question is how the platforms themselves will be regulated, I think. And I think that that, uh, or whether they'll be able to operate in the United States or we'll have to go elsewhere to, to do it. But I, I, I think that they will all find a way. And do you think that, do you have any early predictions on kind of where you see the tea leaves blowing? Because for me, NFTs are basically kind of like ICOs, right? You have a project, you want to fund your project, you create a limited run of NFTs in the hopes that this will fund your game. There's so many games like that, right? Illuvium and Wilder World. And there's so many of these games out there that talk a big game and, you know, have released their initial NFTs as fundraising um, and some of them quite successfully. Um, isn't it kind of the same thing? I think that they, uh, they've not, they have re released NFTs as fundraising, but where the real risk for them probably comes is that they've released tokens as mm -hmm. fundraising, right? It's not really the NFTs that they've raised as fundraising. They had, you know, venture capital pre-sales at a discounted token rate and, they're, and the tokens themselves are trading on the open market. So the question is, what are those tokens? Are they securities or are they utility? Again, I don't think the NFTs themselves are the issue. So you don't think that the NFTs could ever even fall under that kind of scrutiny? Uh, most will not. I think, like I said, I think that down the road, I think people don't realize how many use cases there are for NFTs. And I think that a lot of them could sort of start to look like securities. Certainly, I mean, if you start talking about tokenizing stocks or tokenizing assets that you trade so that you don't have 48 hour clearing and you can trade stocks outside of the E-Trades and Charles Schwab's of the world, then certainly you're talking about a securitized asset. Right. But a picture of an ape, I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Like um, Jordan's Jordans aren't securities, right? When Nike does a release on uh, Jordans that we trade for profit, it's the Jordans, right? And I think yeah, it's more like look, that. that. That's my perspective on it as well. Right. But it's like, you know, it doesn't mean they won't come after it, but I just don't right. think they have much cause. Yeah. Right. Because like when you have something like OpenSea and somewhere like in the middle of, of last year, OpenSea was doing more volume uh, uh, trading per day than eBay, you know, like oh, I started crushing, yeah. you know, absolutely crushing. But uh, I'm assuming that they're paying their dues when it comes to their taxes and overall. Correct. You know, and I, so I, right. So I think the platform might have some risk, but the NFT you buy does not. Right. right? Because so, yeah. the concept of a digital collectible is more akin to your point to a, you know, baseball card or a shoe than it is a stock. Yeah, I think so. Unless you're tokenizing a security, in which case it will get complicated and that will happen. But yeah, I, I don't worry about NFTs right now. Honestly, let's be real, right? How slow is, how much red tape have we already seen in crypto with the government? Do you, I think NFTs are so far down the road on what they need to handle that uh, it'll be a completely different market by the time they even take a look. Oh, trust me, as, as the CEO, CEO of a Swiss-based company, I know exactly what you mean. Um, <laughs> so um, so let me ask you just a few more thoughts as we start wrapping up here. First yeah, of all, thank, of you, time. thank you so much. Um, one thing that I'm fascinated by you is kind of your ability to spot these up-and-coming altcoins and to kind of get a sense of being early, right? You're, you're, you're kind of creating a scientific method around being early. I got lucky because my business partner, uh, who we always, you know, call the inventor of DeFi because he technically he did, um, told me about it, you know, so I was kind of K-factored into crypto, you know, I didn't myself discover it. I just happened to surround myself with people that love what's next with, with you now that it's become more of a scientific method, how do you sort of landscape and survey what are the new tokens? Um, it's an interesting question, and I can't say that there is as much of a scientific method as maybe you'd like to give me credit for. <laughs> I think that the fact that uh, I talk about live, breathe, eat crypto 24-7 every day because I'm accountable to the people that watch me 
the people that listen to my podcast, the people that read my newsletter, I think I'm just putting in the work, right? And I think that like, I, listen, I have a team, you know, I have like a YouTube producer who sends me news stories I should potentially cover. And I have an assistant who sends me news stories and ideas for the newsletter and all these things. So like I have people surrounding me so that I'm constantly, constantly being blanketed with information on what's happening in the market. Mm -hmm. And I think if you're reading about this and, and writing about it, you know, five, eight, 10, 15 hours some days, you're just naturally going to get a very good feel for where the market's going. So I think it's uh, it's a great lesson, right? If you're lazy and you don't do the work, you're just not going to get it in any industry. It has nothing to do with just crypto. I'm just in it all the time. So of course, something you know crosses my desk. It looks interesting. I'm going to go take a look at it and dig in. I think I have definitely a knack for combining sort of an understanding of what may come next as a genre. Like, yeah, first of all, and NFTs I missed, just to be honest. Like, I don't own an ape. Like, I kind of was dismissive of it to some degree. So it's not like I'm always on top of the trend. Metaverse, right. I was all over. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> you know? right, right. right. Um, <laughs> and uh, after seeing how well NFTs did, right? And saying, listen, what's the next obvious um, use case for NFTs? Well, exchanges within these games and within the metaverse, right? And so I think just understanding kind of what's, possible and what could come next and then gaining a bit of sort of exposure to everything in that space sort of that uh pray spray and pray I, I talked about before that works if you were following me six eight ten months ago i was been pounding the layer one drum mm. right i said i don't know which one's gonna work but i know that ethereum has its inefficiencies and i think you should just buy some solana buy some avalanche buy some elrond Buy, you know what I mean? And buy, buy oh, of course, own some Ethereum and they're going to go up, right? And if, and if all of them don't and one of them does, you'll be fine. And that's proven to be a great strategy just because we know all of this stuff is being built in crypto and Ethereum can't support it, right? So just invest in all those layer ones. Then you don't need to find exactly which product is going to succeed because if something succeeds massively on Solana, Solana will go up. You won't capture all that upside, but you have a much safer investment. And so I kind of try to form theses like that, right? You know, and so you, you talked about layer twos. I think layer twos I've been talking about for a while, I think are going to be huge mm -hmm. in the coming year. You know, uh, snarks and roll-ups and all these things that you sort of hear about. Um, I just think anything that improves on the base layers uh, has value. Yeah, and, I, uh, you know, not, sorry to interrupt, but one yeah. thing that I just wanted to drive home as the point is that it doesn't matter if it's, you know, if it's football, if it's filmmaking, if it's writing, if it's reading, anything, it's all about hard work. Ultimately, that yeah. that's that's the point, right? Like you can't just expect an easy crypto is not an easy path. You know, it is a stressful path. And and doing the research, you know, you gotta you, you gotta do the work. You know, people always complain when they play fantasy football that their team sucks. Well, how much research did you do going into the season? You know, football. yeah, I, I'm a I'm a I'm a fantasy football addict. In fact, my podcast tomorrow uh, that I'm releasing is with Matt Kalish, the uh, co-founder of DraftKings. Oh, that, um, oh, wow, that's yeah. awesome! And I fanboyed what? out hard on him actually because I'm a huge fan of daily fantasy football. But I think that what you said is exactly right. Sort of like the meme, the joke, the saying. I don't know the exact years, but you know, it takes 30 years to become an overnight success. Sure. Uh, you know, everybody sees that you got super rich in that one year, but they don't see all your failures for 20 or 30 years trying to get there before. And I just don't think there's any, there are plenty of people who just like, you know, bought a meme coin and got super lucky and may have cashed out and whatever. But your average person, if you want to get rich in crypto or anywhere else, you just got to outwork everyone else. It's always well, been that way. Man, um, today on your podcast, I'm, I heard you talking about something that gave me the chills and I just got the chills again. So it kind of reminded me of that moment that you said on your podcast today that your most effective trading asset is Doge is Dogecoin. Historically. Historically. Yeah. And so, so what, what's your approach? Cause you said something very interesting because Dogecoin has gone up and down, up and down. And you seem like, like just like a surfer who understands what's going on in the swells in the ocean you can kind of predict where the waves are coming in and when the waves are going to die, when the waves are going to crash. What's your kind of philosophy mindset at attacking something as volatile and as interesting as Doge? Well, volatility is a trader's best friend if you know how to use it, right? No, it's nothing more boring than trading an asset that doesn't move, 
right? Uh, you just have to have the emotional control to sort of suffer, suffer through it and uh, follow your plan. But Doge, Love that. you know, I started in crypto in 2016. Somebody introduced me to Doge probably early 2017. And you look at the chart and it has likening it to the ocean, kind of funny, these massive waves, right? And we traded it against Bitcoin. So the value in, in dollars was so fractional, it was irrelevant, right? You never even dreamed Doge would become a penny. And that required Bitcoin going up to such high prices for it to happen, of course. But so you'd trade it, you'd buy it between 15 and 25 sats, wait a month or two, and it would go up to 150 to 200 sats. And you would sell it because it was a meme. You understood you were not investing in something. <laughs> you didn't care what it would be in 10 years. You were doing it to trade for profit. And it was like this community driven thing. You could make endless money. There was tons of volume, tons of volatility. So it would go all the way up. And it would come slowly down over the next month or two. You'd buy it again at the bottom. And I did this three or four times. And so did everyone else. And it was the most fun, beloved meme for making money. It was the greatest asset to trade that ever existed because the cycles were so predictable. Look that said, cool. it hit a penny this time and I sold. I had done right. it again and it went to 75 cents. So I didn't see that cycle coming. I didn't see Doge ever escaping that sort of fun, lovable trading meme uh, which, by the way, it still just sort of is just with much more risk and a lot more uh, people who don't understand the core of what it is, believing that it's an investment. The problem, I'll trade literally anything. And I think people who understand why they're in an asset should, right? Like I'll trade meme and dog coins, but it's because I want to make money now and get out, not because mm -hmm. I want to pay for you know, put it in my IRA and, and wait 30 years to dollar cost average into it like it's some like it's a good company, you know, uh, and I think people who just come in new and see a dog coin first that they, you know, hold forever. Now you don't do hold Doge, right? You know? Yeah. What, and, one thing that, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead, finish your thought. No, I, that, I mean, that, that's the bottom line. It's just differentiating between an investment and a trade and understanding why you're in that trade. And Doge, you know, for years was the most predictable, tradable asset in crypto. That, you know, you mentioned one thing, um, uh, you mentioned the word community. And to me, that's something that I've been learning about this year is something that's a little bit different than it has been in the past, where in the past, it was kind of like you had your insiders, your guys who went to the Macau conference and the Singapore conferences. And that's what I was in, right? It was me and like 80 other guys and we all kind of knew what was up and we knew what the hot ICO was. Now it seems like it's 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 sort of supernova into this discord culture into this community culture how do you uh, um suggest people that really want to do the hard work to your point start to integrate into these communities so it is a really interesting accent so first of all there's all these groups and communities that are probably trash with people trying to like pump up assets and dump like anywhere else so like community is also sort of a meme in the crypto space right there's a lot of people who are taking advantage of that community idea to make a ton of money. So, I mean, NFTs are a perfect example, right? And I kind of joke about this, like you're an ape, right? Apes, punks, those things are going nowhere, right? Mm. Those are the 1952 Mickey Mantle tops, right? The, the right, baseball right. card that never loses its value uh, and will continue to go up. But like all the knockoffs, the, I don't know, lazy lions, uh, you know, petulant penguins and yeah. malicious monkeys. I don't the know. The cousin of the apes and the baby right. of the apes. and the Right. There's all of this. And they've built these communities. And you hear these unfortunate souls in the community. I am my, a I am my monkey and my monkey is me and I will never <laughs> sell it. You know, bullshit. Bullshit. You know why? Because people are in those communities and passionate because the number's going up. Right. And if those things right. go to zero, that community will not exist. They'll all go, wow, I made a big mistake. And these monkeys are worthless. Right. Or, or turtles or whatever they are. And so I think people need to be very, very careful. Like if you're going to do it in the NFT space, just go to the blue chip communities, I guess. Go to the ape. You know, I, I, you can't buy one, probably. You know, you're probably not going to have the money, but hang out in that community. Find out what those people who are at the top of that community are actually talking about and might be investing in next. Right. Go to the blue chips. Go to the ones that aren't like brand new, uh, fresh off the fresh off the boat communities, right? And and go to the ones that have been around for a while and have set a precedence for an actual valuable asset. As far as other things, I mean, there's endless telegrams and discords and all mm -hmm. these things. But at the core, I think you can pretty much just hang out on Twitter 
and figure out who's like decent and reliable. Go find a couple of YouTubers that you like. Never just buy the stuff they talk about. Just go there for the education. Mm. I talk about this all the time. Like I have a newsletter. I'll share some charts in there. It's mostly news and mostly educational. But like at the beginning, I'm like, don't just buy this stuff. I'm giving you a setup. I'm showing you a chart if you like technical analysis of where if this happens, then you would do this if it fits your strategy and you actually have the money to do it, right? Which is mostly not anyone at any given time. You don't go join a community that tells you what to buy and where to buy it and where to sell it and stuff. Nobody can tell you. Nobody knows your financial situation. Nobody knows what your expectation is. So following someone blindly in a group or a community to buy something just because they say it is a trap, right? And that doesn't mean that person is doing something malicious. It just means that they're buying it. They might sell it, never tell you because they never even thought to, right? Oh, How dude, do you know dude, when they the sold rug. Right? I've been rugged so many times. Big Cloud is my biggest oh. rug of all time. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I never claimed my profile there because I was afraid to even like tweet the address. <laughs> um, and someone was like, you've got like 200 grand sitting here for free on Big Cloud. All you have to do is like tweet this uh, Bitcoin address. I was like, I, honestly, man, I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm literally too afraid of the trolling to like claim my six figure uh, bonus, <laughs> right, right, right. which I'll never be able to get off the platform anyways, right? Because, right, uh, right, 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 right. Like I had to go through God knows how many different DEXs to get to my. Sell something. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, I think that uh, I think that community is great with the understanding that most people are just trying to make money. It doesn't mean they're trying to make money on your back or do anything malicious, but like everyone's there because they believe that they're going to profit, not because of like the love and passion for that single thing, you know? Yeah. And I think if you have that expectation and you go in with an educational mindset. I'm going here to learn. I want to understand this market better. I'm not going here to be told what to buy and sell and when to do it. Then I think you can gain a lot of valuable information. Wow. So look, we've gained a lot of valuable information today and I thank you for every single uh, a bit of it. Let me ask you one last question here. What are you what are your kind of high level forecast predictions thoughts about 2022? I, I think that uh, 2021 is going to look like a blip, believe it or not, with how big it was uh, after 2022. And that wow. doesn't necessarily mean like I the price that. of Bitcoin. Just think about where we were at the beginning of 2021. Like we weren't even talking about metaverse. We weren't even really talking about NFTs. Well, we weren't talking about- I and, was, I was, but right, yes. <laughs> yes, we, we being the community at large. I, yeah, right, I, I, not myself either, because like I said, I right, like right, to sort of Right, right, but Facebook was still called Facebook. Facebook right. was still called Facebook. But just think, I mean- if you had told, if I had told you at Christmas last year that uh, they'd be doing a Saturday Night Live skit on NFTs, you would have told me I was nuts and had me committed, right? Right, right? And that happened within like a month of NFTs going viral, <laughs> right, right? right? And so just apply all of the general genres of things the blockchain will be used for and extrapolate that and amplify that. And that's what you have in 2022, right? Right. You're going to have a million more NFTs and platforms and use cases for that. You're going to have, as you're building Club Metaverse right now, you're going to have a million metaverses and, and, and ways to make money in the metaverse. Bitcoin should continue to rise as there's more institutional adoption. I happen to believe there'll be more institutional adoption of Ethereum than Bitcoin probably in the next year. I just think the ones who looked at Bitcoin have looked at it. And so they're going to now be looking for other assets, right? So I just think everything is going to continue to explode. And like I said, whether that means price goes up 100x, I don't know. I just know that we're going to see more awareness and adoption of all of these different facets facets of crypto over the next year. Yeah, there, there's there's an interesting project that I'm involved with called BBS. Are you familiar with BBS by any chance? I'm not actually. Ooh, you got me. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so BBS is a is a, a blockchain-based um, Reddit, essentially, right? Um, so it's basically a social platform. And anyway, my point is is that um, one of my uh, uh, co-hosts in my old uh, podcast, uh, you know, Rula2, um, we started a BBS uh, for him. And basically, you know, each post you can purchase and sell and stuff like that. It's basically like Reddit, but with blockchain and, and actual trading. And, and it's quite interesting. Um, I'll send you a link to it after we uh, stop so, so, so you can check it out. Uh, but the fascinating thing about BBS is that the biggest BBS that we have currently is the Star Wars Theory BBS, and it's complete total normies existing yeah. in this highly like complex. Yeah. yeah, yeah, existing in this highly complex blockchain 
um, architecture. And it's quite fascinating to see how those two things are interacting with each other. Anyway, I'll send you a link to it because I think you might get a kick that, out of it. That's how we'll know we finally made it, right? The biggest barrier to entry for everything blockchain is UX and UI. It's just too complicated for your average person. So when you see right. the normies being the first to adopt something, you know that you've finally gotten to a point where they yeah, can yeah. understand and use it. And you don't have to be crypto native to do it, right? Yeah. What, and so, what, listen, I was, on, I was on Fox Business eight months ago talking about metaverse. Right. Right. I said, listen, you're going to be working in the, they, everyone looked at me like I was crazy. I couldn't <laughs> right, tell you how much right. pushback I got. Nobody thinks it's crazy anymore. Right. And to your point, you talk about BBS. I was recently asked in an interview, well, if you had to choose two things you think will blow up next year, not a continuation of the ones that we already have. You can't say mm -hmm. DeFi or NFTs or metaverse. I would say decentralized social media, which you just touched on. Yeah. I'm seeing, you see, I'm seeing enough CEOs and VCs talk about how do, that could be the next wave that I know that there's things being built I don't even know about, and that's going to be it. And then, like I said, layer twos or anything, roll-ups, all these things that make Ethereum faster. That's really good. First of all, it's really good um, advice. Or not advice. It's a really good notion, right? There's no such thing as advice on the internet. Right. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, well, look, man, that, that, that was absolutely awesome, Scott. I... First of all, when you're down here in Miami, please hit me up. I'm We're gonna, gonna text hang out you all. for sure. Yeah, I'm gonna text weeks. you all my info. We can even go on the boat, you know, hit you know, hit the water a little bit, um, and you know, and do all the kind of things that you do when you ape into something fun, right? Um, uh, yeah, it's amazing. All right, awesome, Scott. Well, Scott, thank you so much. You can find Scott, the Wolf of All Streets podcast is a great listen. You do it twice a day, right? You do it in the morning and so, the afternoon. So I put out the long form podcast Tuesdays and Thursdays, and then I live stream every single morning, every weekday morning at 9.30, and then some afternoons at 1.30. I'm busy. Yeah, yeah. No, you're busy. And, and uh, every time I hear you speak, there's always five or six nuggets that stick with me, man. And I appreciate you for that. And I look forward to talking to you again, sir. Thank you, man. I really appreciate it. Great conversation. And thank you to all that are listening uh, to the Club Metapod. We'll see you again soon.